purpose of this film will be to show how the vacuum tube acts as a valve or gate in an electronic control system. To understand how the vacuum tube works, we must know something about atoms and the tiny parts of atoms known as electrons. It is known that they are set up like tiny solar systems. To draw a comparison, we know that our own planet travels around the sun. The sun is the center of our solar system. And so it is in an atom, except that we call the center the nucleus and the tiny planets that travel around it, electrons. A miniature solar system indeed. And do some of them get complicated? Look at this atom of aluminum. Or this atom of gold with its 79 electrons. But wait a minute. Before we get into this too deep, let's start over again with a sort of poor man's atom. Hydrogen. An atom with one electron. There, that's more like it. The hydrogen atom might be likened to the Earth with its one moon traveling around it. Suppose for a moment our moon was sent hurtling off into space, leaving the Earth without any moon whatever. Would we pick up another moon from somewhere? Well, in our case, we don't know. But in the case of a hydrogen atom whose nucleus had been deprived of its electron, that nucleus would attract to itself a new electron. And here's why. The nucleus of every atom possesses a positive charge of electricity. Each electron in every atom possesses a negative charge of electricity. Unlike charges of electricity attract each other. So a mutual attraction exists between a positive nucleus and its negative electron. The amount of positive charge in the nucleus exactly balances the amount of negative charge in the electrons. It is this tendency on the part of an atom to maintain its balance that underlies the source of all electrical power. The ordinary storage battery is designed to take advantage of this phenomenon. Here's how it does it. In its simplest form, a storage battery is made up of a lead plate and a lead oxide plate immersed in an acid solution. Now let's get back to atoms and see what part they play here. Let's assume for a moment that lead is made up of a nucleus and six electrons. And that lead oxide is made up of a nucleus and eight electrons. Using these symbols to represent all the atoms in the two plates, let's watch the reaction to the acid solution. The acid breaks down the lead oxide and the atoms in the plate lose two electrons. Now, when an atom lacks its full quota of electrons, it tends to attract them from elsewhere. In this condition, the atom is positive. Thus, the lead oxide plate becomes the positive end of our battery. Meanwhile, the acid has built up the lead until each atom has gained two electrons. When an atom has more electrons than it needs, it tends to repel the extra ones. In this situation, the atom is negative, and so the lead plate becomes the negative end of our battery. When we connect the two battery posts with a cable, here's what happens. With the negative lead plate pushing its extra electrons away and the positive lead oxide plate pulling from the other end, we get a flow of electrons from one end of the wire to the other. If we multiply this flow of individual electrons a few billion times, we get our old friend, Mr. Current. And the pressure that pushes Mr. Current is Mr. Volt. Current, as we now see, is simply the movement of electrons through a wire. As long as Mr. Electron remained locked in a wire, he was subject to strict physical and mechanical limitation. But the moment he was freed from his bondage of wires, unlimited possibilities were opened up for his use. First, however, a means had to be devised to arrest him in space.
or in other words, to capture him. This could be done only in a vacuum. And so the vacuum tube was developed. The vacuum tube has one purpose, to control electrons. That's where we get the word electronics. It means simply control of electrons. And now that we know what a vacuum tube is for, let's see how it accomplishes its job. The simple vacuum tube contains a hollow metal cylinder called a cathode and a metal plate. These units are sealed in a vacuum by means of a glass envelope. The vacuum is essential, for if air were to get inside the tube, it would not work. Within the cathode, there is a heater in the form of a wire filament which is connected to its own battery supply. This filament acts as a tiny stove and soon heats up the cathode. Now let's imagine ourselves inside the metal of the cathode itself. And this brings us right back to the subject of atoms. These atoms moving about in reality would be traveling each with its many electrons. But for our demonstration, let's assume each atom has only one electron. What's happening here? Well, first off, the heat has increased the activity of the atoms. Look at them spin. In this traffic jam, there's bound to be a collision someplace. Uh-oh, smacko, just as we thought. Notice that one of the electrons has been knocked loose from its nucleus and thrown clear of the cathode out into the vacuum. Mr. Electron is surprised, perhaps, to find himself kicked out of the cathode, but this being a nice, comfortable vacuum, he'd be content to sit out here indefinitely, and probably would, except that a constant positive charge is kept on our plate by means of a high-voltage source. Electrons will flow through the tube only when the plate has a high positive charge to attract them. Our plate is positive. Now then, knowing that unlikes attract, let's see what happens to our negative, Mr. Electron. The two get together. To repeat, the instant the negative electrons are freed, they are attracted to the positive plate, thus creating a flow of current through space. This space is wide enough that we need high voltage to make our current cross the gap. So we turn to our transformer to boost our voltage. In the previous film, we saw how, in direct ratio to the primary and secondary coils, Mr. Volt was stepped up inside. Now, the transformer gives us high voltage power, but not the right kind. It delivers us AC power, but we need DC power. So, we have a job for the rectifier tube. The tube we have been demonstrating is a rectifier tube of the simpler kind. Let's imagine it hooked up to a source of alternating current. Alternating current, remember, flows in cycles. First one way, then the other. Positive, negative, positive, negative. This means the electrons will flow through our tube when the cycle is traveling in one direction because electrons will flow each time the plate is positive. And they will not flow when the cycle is in the other direction because they will stop flowing each time the plate is negative. The electrons themselves are negative, remember, and will not be attracted to a negative plate. In this way, an irregular or pulsating flow of direct current is produced. In order to control a flow of electrons, that is, to stop and start a flow, we introduce into our tube a new element, the grid. Now we have an amplifier tube, the tube that becomes the valve or gate in an electronic control system. By means of this tube, a weak bridge circuit can control an independent high voltage circuit. In effect, we control something big with something little. It's as though the tiny bridge signal is able to make high voltage power jump through a hoop, that hoop being the amplifier tube. 
The amplifier tube then is our gate through which we release the power we need. And the key to this gate is our grid. Now, a grid is nothing more than a fine wire screen. But simple as it is, it contains the secret of most electronic control. When the grid is charged positive, Mr. Electron will be attracted through it by the plate, which is also positive. Remember always that unlikes attract. And so long as the grid is positive, electrons will flow from cathode to plate. Suppose, though, we hook up the grid to a source of negative voltage. The grid now is charged negative. By this time, we can pretty well guess what will happen. That's right, Mr. Electron was repelled, and in no uncertain terms. Remember, like charges of electricity always repel each other. The important thing to remember is this. The grid is our control element. In effect, it's like a shutter. When it's open, that is positive, electrons flow through. And when it's closed or negative, electrons will not flow through. Therefore, the grid is the key that can unlock our gate, the amplifier tube. Suppose we want to operate some electrical device, for example, a light bulb. To begin with, let's assume this is a 100 volt bulb. We have the bridge circuit set up to deliver a positive or negative signal. Suppose this signal is a small one, say one volt. Obviously, if we hook up the two, the bridge signal will be too weak even to make the bulb glow. So let's connect the bulb to another power supply strong enough to light it. However, we should like to control the light bulb from the bridge. Is this possible? Yes, through the introduction of an amplifier tube. If we unbalance the bridge to the right, sending a negative signal to the grid of the amplifier tube, the grid is turned negative. And in effect, the shutter is closed. Therefore, the light bulb will not receive current and will not light up. On the other hand, if we unbalance the bridge to the left, sending a positive charge to the grid of our tube, the grid turns positive. The shutter opens and electrons flow through, lighting up the lamp. Our bridge signal, remember, is one volt. Now, let's assume this particular amplifier tube can step up the bridge signal 10 times. So, our light bulb receives 10 volts. However, the bulb can take up to 100 volts. How may we deliver to it this extra voltage? Simply by adding another stage of amplification. The first amplifier tube steps up the one volt bridge signal to 10 volts. The second amplifier tube is also capable of stepping up voltage in the ratio of 1 to 10, or the 10 volts to 100 volts, thereby lighting the bulb to full strength. This, then, is amplification. The tiniest change in the bridge will be registered in the light bulb itself and the bulb will grow dimmer or brighter according to the strength of the signal being sent to the grid. Observe that when the bridge was connected to only one amplifier tube, in other words, when it was governing an output of 10 volts, it had to turn to its full tilt to deliver that 10 volts. Suppose the bridge here represented a plane in flight. The plane would almost have to roll over on its back before enough signal would be developed to right it. However, when we add the extra stage of amplification, 
we cut down the distance the bridge must move to deliver us sufficient voltage. In other words, the bridge becomes more sensitive. Before, it had to move its full range to deliver 10 volts. Now, it needs to move only a small part of that distance to deliver the same 10 volts, or only half its range to deliver 50 volts, or its full range only if a signal of 100 volts is required. The system now is so sensitive, corrective action sets in instantly without waiting till the plane is so far out of control it is in serious trouble. Thus we see how electronics can perform the miracle of flying an airplane. The science of electronics beckons man toward new horizons. Electronics can do simple, everyday jobs, such as opening a door or turning on a drinking fountain. It can do complicated jobs, such as sending pictures by television, measuring vitamins in liquids, detecting flaws in metal, it can distinguish two million shades of color, fire big guns and unseen ships, detect airplanes and submarines. It can amplify the human voice so it can be heard around the world. In fact, its possibilities have become unlimited. In order to understand basic electronics, we must understand the basic principles of the vacuum tube. For well, the vacuum tube is the miracle of modern science that can isolate and control the electron.